I, <clears throat> I remember that I'd organized camp meetings um, a lot, but uh, sometimes you can get carried away. <laughs> Where you're just trying to find out, oh God, what do you want to do for the people? What do you want to say to the people? That you also forget that you need to be served also to serve others. You know, so um, as much as yes, we're passionate about the people, as we should be as um, pastors of a church, it's also very imperative that we also understand that. This is as much about us as it is about them. Amen? Yeah. All right. So <clears throat> we're looking at the mindset of a minister. The mindset of a minister, uh, a minister, a pastor, a deacon, <clears throat> whatever. Well, the mindset of a minister. So we'll start with question. First is, what is ministry? I think we've we've talked about, we had a, a training on that before. All right, so what, what is ministry first? In fact, so um, recently I, I, was in, I was in a conversation with someone and the person Apparently doesn't <clears throat> good guy, so there's nothing. I'm just pointing out something because at the end of the day, we all learn every day, right? So there, there is a pastor he doesn't agree with, right? And one of the things I've learned is if I don't agree with somebody, if I don't agree with you on major majority of your doctrinal persuasion, I don't listen to you. All right, there are people who, yeah, just a few I can listen. But when I know that what I'm going to be listening to from you is going to put me in the defensive, I just so what happened was he the guy saw a pastor that he knows I don't I don't listen to his sermons for obvious reasons. Um, then he sent me his his message. It was a sermon he did somewhere that was um, in in his community going a, a little bit viral. So he forwarded it to me. When I saw it and I saw the, the name of the person who did it, I told him, I said, I won't listen to it. And I had to explain to him the reason. If you're in ministry, you want to be careful that you, what you're doing is, 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 no, is not now about responding to, because you see, if we're here now, rather than talking to my wife, maybe myself and my wife are having conversations. You know, people do that thing where you're talking with them, then they have somebody in the audience that they hate. So they are not telling you things, but what they are saying is not to you. It's actually, I don't know if what I'm saying is making sense. You will, you will realize that the person you're supposed to have communications with at that point will be lost. Like, what's going on here? See what I'm saying. See what you are saying. You know, but because that service at that point, that communication is not about responding to someone else. You won't, you lose the whole essence of the communication in the first place. So when you're in ministry also, you have to be very, very careful. There are pastors who their platform now is not is not about responding. You know, I was I was speaking myself and my wife were having a conversation just yesterday about somebody who was in the news for something very, very um, uh, controversial. And he came on the pulpit and said the pulpit is not for him to respond to uh, people who insult him. See, you can respond to people on your Instagram if you want to. That's your personal Facebook. Or you do an interview, not on church platform, on your own platform, and decide you want to respond to things. But if you make the altar about this man of God insulted you, you now come on. That's not what the people need. And just in case God is telling you something that, oh, this person needs, you know, the church needs this word, you would not be in the right frame of mind to pass that word across, simply because there's something that has preoccupied your mind, and that is responding Responding to people that are not a part of your flock. See the folly in that thing. You are responding to people who are not a part of your flock. Your own responsibility is to feed the flock of God that God has given to you. So what you are now doing now is no longer about the people that God has given you responsibility to. 
what you are doing now is now about responding to people who are outside your flock. You realize that what you're doing first is that you'll be selling hate in the people. You'll be selling a lot of bad blood in the people. And you leave the people unattended to because what you are doing is not what they need. So you want to be careful that you're not running services and you're not meeting needs because um, just like you know, Joy and Gabriel had said, ministry is service. And in service, a need is always met. It's like you're going, going to a restaurant <clears throat> and they're just running up and down. They say, ah, we're serving you, sir. They're running up and down. And at the end of the day, you don't come with the menu that you need. You won't say they served you. They were busy, but it wasn't service. And so it, it, we have to be careful, all right? Where, so you don't get to that point where ministry for you is now about being busy, being doing a lot of things, and you're not meeting a particular need. Before we put up every program, we need to ask ourselves, what need is this thing meeting? What's the target? What do we have in mind to achieve in the lives of people whilst we are doing this? All right? Um, let, 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 let's never come, ever come to a point of, you know, because, you know, there are people who target, who target church programs now within a period that another church is having programs so that their members won't attend. Yes, yes, yes. There are people who do programs like that. They don't have, it's not like they have a plan for the program. It's just there's a church, maybe a more a, uh, an equally popular church that is having a program and there's a tendency that our members may attend that program. So in, in order to ensure that our members don't, don't, don't attend that program, let's organize the program around the same time also. So it's now so at the end of the day, if you ask, why are you guys doing the program? Nobody has an idea as to why they're doing the program. It's just, let's make sure that we don't keep them. You know, so there's a lot of things that happens in ministry. And yeah, one of the things you should also understand is that oftentimes when this book started, they had very good intentions. But somehow it's a dogfight. Getting there, a lot of, then you too, you lose. And th that's part of the reasons why we are saying this thing. So that just in case... Anybody begins to derail at any point. You can easily say, oh, remember, sir, when we started, this was what we said, this was, we don't want to do. <laughs> we know how to attack it, all right? Because sometimes on that level, there are a lot of things that happen sometimes. A man can get in the flesh and begin to do things that he's not supposed to do. So first, we've identified the fact that ministry is service and that the aim of service is meeting again. So who then is a minister? Because that's, that's where we're headed. Our, our concern this morning is more on the minister than the service. All right? <clears throat> Our concern this morning is more on the minister than the need he's meeting. So who, who is a minister? From our definition of what ministry is, fantastic, a, a servant who meets the need of the master. All right? So we must understand that ministry is service. Ministry is not ministry is not um, the name calling, the honor that they give you, um, the big, the fine suit, classy suit, you know, being on stage um, with lights shining on you. So you have all of those things are good, but just make sure they are not the reason why you're doing what you're doing. Ministry is service. You see and. By the time we begin to look looking inwards and um, look more into the subject, you see that and in service, people will trample on you. All right? Yeah, people, people, are, going to, people are going to take you for granted in service. You don't know. You, you know, if, if you're someone who is always um, who is always looking after taking care of others, all right, and you don't you don't concern yourself, you don't pay so much attention on yourself. People are going to start taking it for granted at some point. Not everybody does that, but some persons will do that at some point. All right, because so, um, I, I was speaking with my, my elder sister and um, some discussions we were having, and she was reiterating the fact that sometimes people feel like when they call for a need and you respond immediately, it shows that you just have the money kept one place. It's just there, just breathing. They're just looking for, I don't have... Oftentimes, and I, I, I could relate to what she's saying because I know her. She would rather not eat so that everybody can eat. And she has been that way from, from, from when we were very young. That way from when we were very young. 
So I could relate. So some persons began to take that thing for granted. So if they call and there's a need and it's not met, they get angry. And you're asking yourself, like, what's wrong with this person? This person also has a life. You know, it got to a point where she had to not tell someone that, no, no, you are not anybody's responsibility. <laughs> the person that you should be their responsibility is dead. So the next person you should focus on is God. You have to get to that point. Th- that's because when you are in service, people can begin to take for granted that you are there for them. You are meeting you know, their need. So when, in this service, you should also expect that because you can't say you love service and not expect what comes along with service. See, the word is servant. That's what we are. Lead pastor is a chief servant, the number one servant. Assistant pastor is the forward, is the extra uh, servant. Associate pastors, all of us, all servants. So that's that's why we're, we're using lead. Not, not like anybody who uses senior is doing anything wrong. But I just feel like that lead uh, is, I don't know. It feels to me like you are, is, you are leading to do the service. That's the whole idea to it, right? So um, don't do service and not expect what comes with service. Honor comes with service. Yes, we know. Um, um, every other good things come with service. But also, you must also understand that a servant, a servant is more exposed to... Um, humiliation, being insulted, right? And all of those things because it comes with the job. So it will prep you ahead of time. When it begins to happen, you just laugh and be like, oh, we always saw it coming. All right? On some days, you might react. But you see, I I don't judge people by how they react immediately. I judge you if after two days I I speak with you and you you still have that mindset. Do you understand what I'm saying? Some, someone spoke to you in a very terrible way and you shouted, insulted the person. <laughs> That's fine. But if I check back with you after two days and you still insist that that thing you did then was right, then I have a problem with you at that point. Because I feel like um, on the spur of the moment, people can react based on emotions. If I sometimes don't even know the state of mind the person is at that point, react. But if after that time, I still check back two days, one day, two days, three days, and you are still, ah, I'll be wary of you. I had an experience with someone like that who reacted wrongly and did something very terrible to someone. So I felt, okay, 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 maybe ego stepped in and, you know, you reacted the way you reacted. Check back after three, three, four days, and the person was still insisting on what, I, 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 I had to just be careful. So eventually, by the time the person starts started doing other things, I wasn't exactly surprised because you must understand that what people do to others, they most likely will do to you. It's just what it is. What people do to others, they most likely they are going to do it to you. It, it may take some time, it may take a while, but eventually they would. All all that needs to happen is for you to be in the same position that the person who did that thing was, and you will get there one day. You know, just me, I was saying that he said. Any human being who lives on earth, who breathes, will hurt you. Says it is an unrealistic expectation to feel, oh, he, he's the source of my joy, the source of my happiness. Even source of joy will offend you also. So you should expect it. All right? Yeah, you, can't get, you, you can't get it both ways. Everybody is complete package. Amen? Yeah. So but like, like I said, where the issue is, is if we check back with you four days, three days, two days, in fact, 24 hours later, and you are still sustaining that fully mindset that you had, then you know that this one is no longer somebody just responding to an emotional impulse. It is now who you are in person. All right, so we looked at ministry, we looked at who the minister is. Now, number one thing, the mindset of a minister, number one is there is ministry unto the Lord, and there's ministry unto the people. <laughs> there is ministry unto the Lord, and there is ministry unto the people. Let's see Acts 
Okay, let's see first. Uh, okay, I think let's see Acts 6 1 to 7. There is ministry unto the Lord, and there's ministry unto the people. Now, um, before we read Acts 6, understand that ministry unto why are we not with Bibles? Okay. I sure this phone opens faster. All right. So you must understand that the source of your ministry to the people comes from God. All right. What makes you because you don't even know what to serve the people. I said to find out from God what he wants because they are his flock. Jesus is the shepherd of the people. He's the chief shepherd. All right, we we are just assistants to him. So it is like is like um take for instance my wife now. My wife is the one who has in terms of what what food to give Joshua. She's the one who is directly responsible for that. But all of us, <laughs> including myself, even when she travels and uh, I'm, I'm around, before you, you find, okay, what, what, what is he supposed to eat? If anybody ever gets to the point where you now decide this is what you want to give the child, it is no longer service. I don't know if you understand, because the child is not yours. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. All right? It's the same thing with Jesus. Jesus is the chief shepherd. So there should never be a time where we ever get to the point where we can decide this is what I want to do for the flock without finding out from him. These people are your people. What do you want me to do for them? So that is how ministry works. So your service unto the Lord is what puts you in the right place to serve the people. But if you stay only in the point of just serving God, you know, so... You just pray, pray, pray. You fellowship, fellowship, fellowship. But you don't have any relationship with the people. You can't bring service to them. So you must learn that balance that there is service unto God. And that service, service unto God is basically fellowship. Doing his will. Taking instructions from him. All right? Um, finding out from him what he wants, to, wants you to do. In the place of fellowship, you get to that service unto the Lord. But... If you stay there and if uh, if someone says, you find out, okay, if I find out from my wife, okay, ah, what, what should Joshua eat today? And she says, X, Y, Z. Then after she's done saying, I say, okay, 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 that's fine, that's fine. And I don't have, I don't do the food and give to Joshua. You know, it becomes a problem because the boy is going to be hungry. So that's how some persons, some ministers are. We oh, we love the Lord. We copy, we hear everything. How that is going to use you to be a blessing to people and all of that. But you don't have any relationship with the people you're standing with. Jesus, with how mighty he was, had relationships with people on earth. Amen? Yeah. The, the Joseph of, of uh, what was his name? Arimathea, yeah? That went to demand for his body. It was a relationship also. Yes, he wasn't captured in the Bible, but he was a disciple of Jesus. So you can't effectively do ministry if all you have is relationship unto God and you don't have relationship unto the people. And in relationship unto the people, there are, there are a lot of human things you need to learn. <laughs> with God, thou art word, it works, but not with the people. There are things you have to learn. You need to learn how to relate with people. You need to learn, like, like we said, how to take offense. You see, offense is a large part of, management of offense, sorry, is a large part of the work we do. Oh, yes, it is. How to manage offense, how to um, speak with, even on this uh, 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 group, there's a way I talk to some persons that I can't talk to others. Not because you are scared of anybody. It's just you learning, this might work with this person, but with some other person, that won't work. All right? I thought your pen stopped. Uh, okay. You know. All right? So you have to learn it. So if, if, if all you know how to do is just how to talk to God, just after I've spoken to God, I don't care about how I talk to anybody. No, you have to learn it. You have to. 
So there's a ministry unto God and there's a ministry unto the people. And so we've said, if you only focus on a ministry unto God and you don't focus on ministry unto the people, there'll be an issue because you don't feed people well. Also, if you focus on the ministry to the people, to the people, everything you are doing with, with the people, with the, that you don't longer have time to find out from God what you should feed them. Bible says, um, Jesus, Jesus say, say, says, say, who is that servant who the master apportions to, to give meat to uh, the fellow servants at the time due? So there's what you should give to people at a specific time. But the problem is, if what you heard the last time you are, uh, uh, the last time you, you asked God, God said, okay, teach them. That's why you hear sometimes that some, some ministers, their emphasis will change from time to time. You've, we've, we've, uh, yeah, right? There are people like that who, if you listen to them, there, there's a there's um, uh, uh, an apostle in Nigeria who, when he started, all he was teaching was intimacy. That was all he was teaching, intimacy, intimacy. After a while, God moved him from just teaching intimacy to teaching other things. But you still see that everything he's teaching is still coming from that point of intimacy. So if you hear now, if you, you went to ask, say, let's say well, you have a chef in your house, all right? And you told your chef, all right, um, for one week, let everybody eat eba. So cook different soup. The chef now starts serving the people, serving the people, but does not have any relationship with the person who appointed him. The day the person changes his mind and says, okay, let's change to yam and rice and beans, you know what will happen? The guy will still be serving ever. You know why? Because if, even though he has a relationship to the people he has been sent to, the one who sent him, he has lost relationship with the person. So it's a tricky place. So you need to learn how to be with the people and also be with God. If you ever lose out on one, you can't be effective with ministry delivery. You can't be. All right, so let, let's see Acts 6, verse 1 to 7. Acts 6. And see, there are, they are very, very, very particular things that I, I quickly have to point out. Take, for instance, in your relationship with God, is unconditional. His love for you is unconditional. Yeah. So even if you even if you blast God, tell him, I don't want to serve you any longer. I don't want to have anything to do with you. If you come back tomorrow, no, not tomorrow, the next minute and say, I'm sorry. In fact, whilst we're saying that thing, he wasn't taking it seriously. All right. If you come back the next minute and say, I'm sorry, I, I, I shouldn't have said what I said. I was wrong. But you know, God will just eh, let's move on. Let's move on. Because his love has covered the sin already before you did it. But if you do that to a human being and expect the person to forgive you as quickly as God does, say because he's a Christian, you are a believer now, shouldn't we love unconditionally? You should know that human being is human being. All right? So the principle of unconditionality works with God, but not so with the people. You see God, no matter how many times you hurt God, it doesn't change anything. I mean, I mean, of us have count of how many times we offend God in a day. It doesn't, have you ever heard one day that you're trying to talk to God and God was frowning? You know how to ask him, God, man, okay, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? You're not begging, begging, begging before you accept it. But if you, if you expose a human being to that level of hurt on a daily basis, the person will begin to react. The person will start giving you cold shoulders, cold feet. You talk, they give you one word response. Not because the person is bad, but because the person is a human being. So the, the principle with which that works with God, you can't assume that automatically it works with the people. You can't assume. With God, God knows the intent of your heart. God knows what is in your mind. God knows everything that, it says, all things are naked. Hebrews 4, verse 30, before whom we have to do, God, before him we have to give account. So even without you saying anything, God already knows what you are trying to pass across. Amen? If you use the, you know, that certain times we won't pray, we use the wrong words. But God picks what is really, really in our hearts, and you see answers to the prayer you pray. But if you want to speak to a human being, you have to use the right word. One of the things I've, 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 I've adopted as a principle is to never have an expectation on people, on things I have not taught them. If I haven't taught you, I would assume you don't know it, except for the ones that are common sense. 
things, all right? There are certain things that are common sense that are basic. Everybody should know it. But for, for the ones that are very, very technical, I, I don't expect... So I, I was in a conversation this morning with a, a couple of pastors, and somebody sent... Somebody wanted to send money to the pastor as Christmas gift. So what he did was, two persons actually, they sent the money to ministry account. Right? Now, if it has entered there, it is now church money. My principle. Some, uh, one of the pastors said, no, that, that you can tell them, maybe tell the person to write a letter that I made a mistake. I said, if you, if you open that that level one day somebody will generate and you will receive letter after the person has thought about it and send the money so no need once that's gone in there just take it as it is now church money and forget about it but one of them said you know the person who experienced that and said but that he expects that they should know that they should just know that that church money and his own personal money are not the same because he actually needs the money he needs the money so he's in a fix and these people should know because we were not advising him, mention it to the person that, oh, thank you so much for supporting the ministry. He said, no, it's you again. He said, oh, no, 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 that once the money has gone into church, it's not for the church. For the next time, send to my personal account. The one that should be, he said, no, that I can't be telling them those kind of things. And I told him the same thing I was saying. I said, don't expect people to, to know what you've not taught them. Don't, that, that's too technical. Some persons just feel like ministry is a sole proprietorship. You know, so provider, the account of the company is your own account. Any day you need money from, you can take from it, and nobody has any issue with it. But with church, it's a different ballgame entirely. Somebody says, I want to send money to you, and they send it to the account. Just take it as, for integrity's sake also. Because just imagine, every, every, every month, there's a money sent to church. Then in statement of account, we sent it to pastor's account because pastor said that the person who sent it was supposed to send it to him directly. For integrity sake, it's not necessary. Just leave it once it has entered there as proper. So when I mentioned it to him, he said he expects that they should know. He expects that they should uh, say no. Don't that that's you outsourcing the responsibility of teaching your members to a different ministry. You understand what I'm saying? Because who else is going to teach the person? It's a different ministry. So why not teach it? You expect that they should go and hear it from somewhere else, and that person should teach them, then they will not implement it in your church. If you want them to have that culture, if you want them to have prayer culture, you want them to have uh, giving culture, you want them to have culture of fasting, culture of love within the brethren, model it and also teach it. Don't just expect them that they should know that when we are worshiping, we should lift up our hands. No, no. Assume that they don't know and teach it. One of the days I appreciated this more was when I was in uh, uh, Rema Bible School. We, t- we, uh, we had a course on, uh, was it the joy of the Lord? Rejoicing, rejoicing in the Holy Ghost or something. When, before we started, you know, the, the, the uh, minister who was teaching said, said that um, every time we t- have these teachings, that I know some of you are here now, you're saying you can't dance in the spirit, you can't shout in the spirit, you can't rejoice in the spirit. But I, every time we've had this teaching, we always see crazy things happen within the within the unit church. As he was saying it, I was looking at people because I mean, guys are dressed prim and proper, old people, young persons, mature persons are in there. So I was looking at everybody, I was like, ah, how will this happen? People just start shouting. True to what he said, by the time the teaching, the teaching is life, it's communicating something to your spirit. We're not done with the class when we had to break the session and everybody was everybody had gone gone haywire in the in the hall. Pray, shout, glory to God. Even me, I was jumping, shouting, glory to God. That was the day I, I, I further understood, right, that there's something teaching does. It's not just, you're not just communicating information. You're communicating life to the person. So all of a sudden, something that was trapped in the person's mind all, all, all the while just received life because you, you're teaching it. And they are seeing it from the Bible that what you're saying is true. So, Ministry unto the people. Let's see Acts 6, 1 to 7. I thought by now somebody would have opened it to read. Hallelujah. Mm. 
So, so, so you see here now that the problem in this church, the reason why there was murmuring, was because there were people who were serving unto, who were doing service unto the Lord, unto the Lord, but they didn't have people to serve unto the people. So you say, all I just need to do is just pray fast, and the church will be fine. No, it won't be fine. You have issues. Because that thing you are doing is service unto the Lord to place you in a position to serve the people. But you, are still, you still have problem in the church. So they are, the, 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 what was it called? The 12 were the persons doing this work. But they didn't have as much time to do it any longer because they had to give more time to prayer and fasting and finding out what does God want to say to the people. But even though they were teaching the word, the one that was supposed to be done in structure didn't happen because they neglected structure and paid attention just to pray, to fasting, finding out what God wants to say to the people. And there was murmuring in the church. I know when there's a, there's a place murmuring gets to, people now start developing factions. Right? There's, you know, it starts like that. Say, oh, you too, you experience the same thing. Before you know, there will be a leader in that faction that will say, okay, let's to attend to Israel and the church would have scattered. So when they saw that this thing was coming up, see, they said, it is not reason that, reason there means it's not wise for us to leave the word and serve people. Meaning that what they were doing all the while that made the murmuring to come up in the church was that they were doing what? Yeah? Yeah. They were doing service unto God, meaning that they were focusing on the word, focusing on praying, fasting. Nobody was serving tables. So verse 3 now. And the same is the whole multitude chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and the Canon, and Timon, Amenas, and Nicholas, the Proselyte of Ultia, whom they set before the apostles. So when they set the order for the structure, see what it produced. Number one is that the word of God increased. So meaning the disciples were now ministering more powerfully. They're ministering strongly. They, rather than just teach a few things, they were able to teach more. And the word of God increased, that's one. Then the number of the disciples increased in Jerusalem greatly. You see, the number of disciples increasing in Jerusalem is a miracle because the Jews already feel like they are saved. They feel like they don't know, they don't have need for Jesus. Who is Jesus? The son of Mary, like they called him when he went to his hometown. Son of Joseph the carpenter. We know him. We know his brothers. So for, for the word to increase in Jerusalem was a big miracle. Now, not only that, the Bible says a great number of the priests were obedient to the faith. This didn't happen because they paid attention because sometimes you can fall for that, that trick to feel like all I just need to do is just pray to just fast. Are you there for people? Do you call them? Those are the little, little things. You are the head of a department. People don't come to church, uh, attend meetings. You don't even check up on them to find out, okay, what's going on, bro? So, so, and so, we didn't see you in the meeting. We observed for the past two days, we've not seen you in the meeting. What's going on? Why are you absent? Those little things. You may say, I'm praying for them. I'm praying for them. <laughs> like <laughs> someone who said uh, 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 that they are celebrating my wife in, in, in private, but you don't say it publicly. Like, it does, doesn't make sense to people. People are having issues, you don't show up. People are celebrating, you don't, sh- you don't show up. You don't show up, you don't even show concern. You just feel like your own work is that you are praying for them. Somebody calls you and tells you, oh, I'm about to travel. You don't check up. You don't, you don't know that that thing they said ready, should register something in you that you should check up on them on their way. Find out, how are you doing? How was your trip? 
Those things don't take so long. Two minutes, one minute, you're done. It registers something in the heart of the people. So it's not only attendance to prayer, fasting, that grows the church, that makes the, the ministry work prosper. It's having these structures in place. Some you can do for yourself. Some you can't do. You follow up to ensure it is done. All right? So that's the way this thing works. And the Bible did not say that the church grew greatly when they were praying and fasting again. It says when they now put this structure in place to ensure that the service unto the people was working smoothly and they also, things worked out well. But even at that, it wasn't like the apostles were just locking themselves up inside the room and praying every day. They still mingled with the people. Say, so how do I know? When, uh, what was that name? Is it Lydia? died. Huh? Lydia, sorry, died. It was Peter they went to call. Peter didn't say, I'm going to just stay in the room. He pushed down to stop me. No. Uh, what was his name? Lazarus died. They came to call Jesus. That's service. Oh. They came to call him. Even though he stayed four days more before he went, he still went. How many times did people come and call Jesus? My, my, my daughter is about to die. Come and pray for him. That was service. He had to be there for people also. And when he came before Lazarus' tomb, he cried first. Somebody will say, didn't he know that he was going to? He knew he was going to raise the guy from the dead, but he cried first because he could feel the pain that they were feeling. So don't be distant from people. The people you've been called to serve, don't be distant from them. Being distant from them, being, you know, some people feel like, the reason why I'm trying to be distant from them, and we all fall for that trap sometimes. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be distant from them because I want to preserve my respect. You are losing a vital aspect of service when you do that. You're losing a vital aspect of service. Why do you think Jesus will sometimes go to the house of tax collectors to go and eat with them? To go and fellowship with them? He will have stayed away and just be teaching them from a distance. He will go to their house to go and eat. Some of you just... <laughs> some of you, you see Jesus, you see a pastor now in M.C. Lomo's house. Some of you will say, ah, what's he doing there? But that was what Jesus was doing. You go to a task collector, Nicodemus, go and eat in his house. It's fellowship. Somebody dies, he will go there to go and pray. That was fellowship. So you see that also, that Jesus had service unto God, because the Bible tells you that a great while before day, he would rise up and go to a solitary place to pray. All right? When he's done with prayers, he will come and discuss with his disciples. When he's done with discussing with the disciples, he will go out and go and preach to other persons. That was service. Don't become distant. Too distant from the people that you've been called to serve. Because when you do so, you have the message from God, but you won't have the acceptance of the to the people. You have the message from God, but they will fight it. Because the one who is coming to deliver it unto them is, is the stranger. It was the same thing that happened to Moses, right? Moses knew in his heart, in Acts 7, according to Stephen, that he was a deliverer that God had sent to the people. He knew. That was why he went there to go and separate fight. Right? Stephen said he assumed in his heart that the people should have known. But he was a stranger to them. That was the problem he had. He was a stranger. Nobody knew him. All they had known him, uh, Joy, let me be seeing your face. Okay. All they had known him for, all right, was that he was the son of Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter. That was all they knew. So he just woke up one morning because maybe he had a body in his heart. He comes now and says, um, um, you people should stop fighting. He had the message, but he didn't have the acceptance of the people because he was distant from them. He was always in the palace. He wasn't with them there. If that message had come through Aaron, because Aaron was with them, and that was why eventually when he was about to come back, do you know what he did? He called for the elders of the people. Did, did, you, did you see that in the Bible? Yeah. How he, he didn't go to them immediately and say, Thus says the Lord. No. He spoke to the elders of the people. And he convinced the elders that this is what God has sent me to do. He recounted his encounter. They heard, Oh, truly, God sent you. Then the elders were able to convince the people. Then when they now saw that he was fighting for their cause, because he didn't have any need to come back, he was free. He had run, run away. All right? First is that what got him into trouble in the first, the first place was not, uh, was not his own cause. It was that he was trying to fight for them. 
So they now heard that he had run away. So okay. Then he came back. He spoke to the elders of the world, the people who had direct relationship with the people he was coming to do ministry to. Have the message, <laughs> but don't be distant from the people. Jesus did it. Have the message. And don't also be very close to the people and not have the message. That balance has to be there. That balance has to be there. Don't anyone you miss out on, you become effective in your service delivery. Acts 13, verse 1 to 2. So what we're trying to say here is that ministry, the mindset of a minister, number one, is that ministry is unto the Lord and unto the people. Acts 13, 1 to 2. Acts 13, 1 to 2. Hallelujah. The Bible says, thank you. The Bible says that as they did what ministered unto the Lord and fasted. So oftentimes you get your ministry unto the people whilst you are ministering unto the Lord. All right? Often that's how it works. You get your ministry unto the people whilst you are ministering unto the Lord. That's why you always hear, how did Moses get ministry unto the people at the burning bush? He was ministering unto the Lord. He was in fellowship with God. And God tells him, I have seen the affliction of my people. I have seen their suffering. I have come down to, to, to deliver them. Go now, I send you. See, that's that's the way it works. He, Moses did not go to do for the people what he wanted to do for the people. He went to do what God wanted him to do for them. Because what God told him was, I have seen their affliction. I have seen their trouble. I have come down to deliver them. Then he says, I'm sending you. So the minister's responsibility is to fulfill the will of God for the people. What is in the heart of God for the people is what you are called to fulfill. And it also shows in your service delivery, your, your, your sermons, even how you give counsel. Don't, don't switch into emotions. Amen. We learned that very important lesson myself and my wife. You know, through our, our daddy, daddy Obi. When you go and present an issue that is very emotionally engrossed, and he will tell you, the Bible says, if I, when he started saying that, the Bible says, somewhere in my mind, I was like, what's wrong? Can't this man see? That's what was going, going through my mind. Like, can't this man see the facts on ground? Why is, which one is this the Bible says? The Bible says, until, immediately I said that, the Spirit of God asked me, oh, there's now something wrong with somebody sticking with the Bible. And I get that. So even when you give counsel, stick with the word. What's the worst that will happen? They will reject what you've said. But never forget that your ministry to the people is what is the will of God for them, not what you want for them. And that's why I said, as a minister, you have to preserve your heart. If you know that you are, there's somebody you are going to listen to, and every time you listen to him, you are angry, you start maybe wanting, you know, there are people we are listening to, as, as you are listening to them, you are countering what they are saying in your heart. I don't know if it has ever happened to you. Yeah, you are countering what they are saying. Don't do it, because... Chances are that the next time you have an opportunity to speak, you may not speak the will of God. You may speak, you most likely you are going to start talking about what you heard and how because after you've heard that you're, you, you found the correction, you want to implement the correction almost immediately. All right? So it was wise they were ministering unto the Lord. Uh, 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 the Lord said, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, unto the work that I've called them for. Now, they received that work. They didn't stay. They didn't remain there. They went to the people. So ministry unto the Lord is where you get your message, is where you get your assignment unto the people. The same way, if you're going to preach, you don't just wake up and just become creative and say, okay, okay, ah, there's a trend now going on, the mystery of the seven angels. That's not what God has sent you to teach your people. All right? So whatever he has told you to teach your people, teach them. If tomorrow he tells you, teach the mystery of seven angels, 
but for ev for the the diet for all the flock may not always be the same all right the same way if you um if you have children sometimes the specification of what you give each person may differ from person to person i've seen that before you say give this person golden moon this person will not eat golden moon in the afternoon give this other person indomie give, give this other person rice that's 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 god saying the shepherd of this church, give them this. The shepherd of this church, give them this. You will now look at this other church and say, okay, I like what they are teaching. It's, it's, it's giving the man of God more visibility. <laughs> it's giving the man of God more visibility. Me too. I'm going to teach the same thing. And you copy someone else, lose out on what God wants you to feed the flock. And every time you are gaining visibility and your members are not growing, the flock is getting thinner. Yeah, every time you see them, they are getting they they they, they, don't, they are not robust in their spirit. That's because what you are giving them is not what, and you can't know more than the person that sent you to do the work. You can't. So understand that there's a difference between ministry unto the Lord and ministry unto the people. Uh, number two. To deliver the Lord's message, the minister must be ready to go through a lot of changes or sometimes death. The same way a pregnant woman's body sees a lot of change for her to give birth. To deliver the Lord's message, the minister must be ready to go through a lot of changes or sometimes death. The same way a pregnant woman's body sees a lot of change for her to give birth. The, the, yeah, I want to, I want to give birth, but I don't want swollen legs. I don't want to throw up in the morning. I don't want my appetite to be affected. I don't want my, what was that in the, that bone? Yeah, that expands. Pelvic bone. I don't want it to expand. Well, if your pelvic bone does not expand, the child is going to be trapped inside the womb and you won't be able to give birth. The person will just be there 12 years, no child. Why? Because you want to be pregnant and give birth and you don't want any change in your body. If you see somebody who does ministry truly, you must change. Oh, you must change. <laughs> it can't be the same. No, you can't. In fact, the best leaders in, in corporate world should be those who have served in church. The best leaders in corporate organizations should be those who are serving in church. Because there's no other place where service is real. You know, you are serving there and you are not expecting to be paid. So it's easy for you to say, well, after all, they're not paying me, and you leave. But you are serving there and you are faithful. How will you not now be very good Serving in a place where you know that at the end of the month they are giving you money. Even though we know that the kingdom money is the kingdom payment is better than that one. But you understand what we we're saying in context. So you can't be an effective minister, deliver the Lord's counsel to the people, and remain the same. You can't. So if you find somebody who year in, year out, they are still the same, you can't find any change. You stay around them for 12 years, and you've not seen any change in their character, in their attitude, in what they do, and forget it. That person is not serving. He's not serving. Because true service will change you. True service will kill you. <laughs> All right. True service will kill you. Yeah. Myself and my wife, we are very private persons. Too private. We don't like people in our space normally. But now we love the idea. You know why? It's service. We know that we can't do the Lord's work and just say, uh, let me just leave alone. Let, you know, feel that can't work. It can't work. It can't. You'll be very, very ineffective. So that, that if service would, would, would regulate your appetite, it would, it, would dictate, it would dictate what you like and what you don't like. Hmm? service would regulate your appetite to dictate what you like and what you don't like. So 
So let, let me say this, that there are some dimensions of faith that you can't even teach until you've allowed the Lord to kill unbelief in you. So the minister's journey is such that what he learns for himself is not only for himself. It's an experience he's supposed to call other persons into. So God is trying to teach faith through you. And every time he has told you to take steps that are, that are, that are faith-dependent steps, you give excuse. Oh, Lord, I can't do this. Lord, I can't do this. You will never be effective as a minister to teach that dimension of faith. You can't. Because your ministry delivery would, would, would determine the debt you are supposed to be exposed to. What is supposed to die in you? Yes, it would. It would. Just imagine someone who's who's um imagine somebody who's who's um what's it called? Um yeah, so imagine somebody who's primary responsibility to the body is to teach patients and the person is an impatient fool. Just imagine somebody who's, who's calling is to teach love and the person is a war, is a fight. <laughs> just, just imagine. That's your, your primary call is to teach love to the body of Christ. But you are war, you are fight, you are scattering everywhere. Oftentimes that's because that person did not submit his or herself to the death process that is required for him to become a model of what he's teaching. Because you can't teach something and your life does not model it. You can't just be teaching faith, 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 faith. And when we look at your life, there are no evidences of the times where God led you by faith and you walked. You walked even when he was blind. All you were seeing was in, in the eyes of faith. You can't teach faith. You can't. So the death process God will submit, subject you to, oftentimes will be regulated by the message he has given to you. So just like I said, just the same way, you can't say you want, you don't, I want to get pregnant, I don't want to get, I want to get pregnant, and you just want your body to be the same. You just want your people, the people you are looking up to are people who have never given birth before. So I want to have this person's body. Well, you can't have that body if you're going to get pregnant. Maybe in the long term, after some time, after a lot of uh, exercise, surgery, and all, you may get there. But you can't get there if you're going to get pregnant. So I want to, I want to be the... <laughs> all right? That can't happen. Let's see um, John 12, 24 to 26. So death, death is a natural prerequisite for anybody who wants to be an effective minister. You must die. You must. You must. If not, the message won't be effective in your mouth. It won't be. John 12, 24 to 26. Unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, mm. a plentiful harvest of new life. Mm. 25. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this okay, world. Babe, babe, I think I take that, uh, the first two verses again. Thank you, David. Yes. Where, where, where did you read it from now? Okay, read, 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 read from that. I told you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, mm. it remains alone. Mm. But its death will produce many new kernels. So when it dies, it will produce many new kernels. But if it does not die, it will just have itself. Eh? It will just abide alone. If it doesn't die. You can have revelation of faith, but if you don't die, you won't call other persons. If you don't die to unbelief, you won't be able to call other persons into that faith experience. You can have the revelation of love, have it in your mind, but if you don't go through this, the process of death, you won't be able to call other persons into that experience. Because it's even it's practically impossible for you to teach people what you have not experienced. I'm, I'm not just saying experience in terms of revelation. And experience also in terms of walking. All right? If 
every time you share testimony, testimony, it should be a prayer for you. Every time you share testimony of how that God did this, you are you always using different persons. You can't use it, you've never used it now. Um the man is not the message, Jesus is the message. All right, Jesus is the message. But the things we there are things we learn from the lives of persons also in the Bible, right? Yeah. Peter, Paul, uh, Timothy, John, Jedidiah, everybody in the Bible, Jedidiah. <laughs> All right, everybody in the Bible, you learn something from them. So your life also should be added to the number. And our learning from their life does not invalidate the message of the gospel. It doesn't. So there's nothing wrong with you. So if every time we share testimonies, we only hear in the days of Alan, Alan, John Alexander Dewey, in the lakes of, in the days of John G. Lake, in the, how, when, Chief, when are you going to come inside the picture so that other persons can also use your own story also. Because people can assume that the move of God has died with those in the old. If all the things that we hear that God did happened in the days of old. But your life can be a proof that this thing is still happening right now. But you can't have that experience if you remain the same. The same way service will change you. That, that's, what, that's what we're looking at, all right? Service will change you. It will kill certain things in you. You can't be an effective minister if certain things in your life does not go. Because you can't serve God the way you are. Things have to die. Yeah, things have to die. Colossians 3 verse 5. Then someone else, Second Timothy, we read 2 Timothy 2 verse 20, 21. Colossians 3 verse 5. Very straightforward. Scripture. Then Second Timothy two. So put to death the deeds, earthly things, loving within, have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. So, if you are going to be the Lord's servant. There are things God expects you to kill. See, one of them is evil desire. <laughs> All right, evil desire. You've not done it, too. You've not done it. You just, you just have that desire. Say, ah, how I wish. I can just see, go to Central Bank now and steal money. Just $1 million. You've not done it. And chances are that if you are given a gun, you won't do it. But you have that, that desire in you. That's evil. It's evil desire. Kill it. Kill it. Because one of the things I've learned is that if a desire stays long in you, you act it out. One day you will. Maybe 20 years, maybe 40 years, but one day you will. You will. Second Timothy. Yeah. So so take note. It says in a great house. The kingdom of God is a great house. A great mighty house. Everybody in it is saved. But some are vessels of gold. Some are vessels of silver. Some are vessels of wood. Some clay. So in the ranking of vessels, clay is the least. All right? And hold on to this thing I just said now when we, uh, in one of the, the points we're going to look at. In the ranking of vessels, clay is the least. It starts with gold, then it goes to silver, it goes to wood, then it goes to earth. Then he explains to you that some vessels out of these rankings are vessels unto honor and some unto dishonor. You see, in the same kingdom of God, there are people that if somebody wants to insult a pastor, there's somebody in the church that will always be a bad mouth that can insult the person back. You, you know that. Yeah, there are always people like that. Who if you say, ah, that pastor is a very stupid pastor, the person will say, see, is it my pastor you're talking to like that and would insult you, insult down to your grandfather, your grandmother? That person is a vessel. But... <laughs> But it's not a vessel unto honor. Unfortunately, we, 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 need to, we need to call things what the Bible calls them. 
and we we'll explain them, them now as we go down. What qualifies an individual to be a vessel unto honor is a refining process. Gold does not become gold until it is refined. Before gold becomes pure, there's, there are a lot of impurities that has to go out of it, right? Yeah, a lot of impurities. If, you, if it doesn't go through that process, it won't become that thing. So stop desiring to be the person who they will use, they say, ah, this person is always doing bad. We need somebody one day has to teach him, teach him that is this thing is doing is leave that for vessels unto this honor. Because what you need to understand is that that person that is responding to that that is insulting somebody on social media or insulting somebody, insulting the person's grandfather, the person is not just doing it for church. That's how the person is at home. So you now that God has refined to maybe silver or he has refined you to gold, you are now desiring to carry the impurities because of one occasion. Be you, be vessel unto honor. But the beauty to you, just like when Jesus said, the poor you have always with you, it's not a prophecy. It, the truth is that you always have poor people on earth. Hmm? So... So that's, that's why I'm also saying that within the body of Christ, there will always be vessels unto this honor. You always have them. Some have decided to be dead permanently for the rest of their lives. Some, they, are, they just came into the faith, so they are on the process of, do you understand what I'm saying? Process of, when Peter cut off the ear of Marcus, when they came to arrest Jesus, Jesus did not clap for him, say, ah, Baba, you're too good, I see your zeal, you're a powerful guy. He rebuked him and put the ear back. Because violence is not the way to establish the kingdom. But sometimes the violence, people will use violence within the church. There, there's a kind of problem that will happen. See, God is smart. Because Jesus is a vessel unto honor. He didn't approve the violence. God is wise. So he knows what he's doing. You focus on the level of refining that God has submitted you to. They say, somebody has to teach that guy a lesson. It mustn't be you. Leave that for ve vessel of dishonor. Insults his mother. Insults the father. Insults the spouse. So if somebody insults the pastor, he's going to fire, fire that person. If tomorrow the pastor even says something that the person of the owner does not like, the, the pastor too will collect. Because you can't train people to be dogs to others and they will not bite you too. So learn a lesson from Jesus. Did he not need defending? Because he was one that told them, take up your sword. Take up your... But when they came, because he was in his sight, he told them, I rebuked the guy. Because he's a vessel of the owner. So if every time you advise people, be mad. If they insult you, give them back. One day, you too, you mistakenly insult them and they'll give you back because you've trained them to act that way. So the same way Jesus said you, there will always be poor amongst you. Is me also telling you that there will always be vessels of dishonor for different reasons. One is that some persons have decided ever that for the rest of their lives, they are going to remain vessels of dishonor because every time God wants to submit them through death, they don't want to. Say, ah, I will not be quiet so that they will not be riding on me. That's how you become vessels of dishonor. We'll see that now in the uh, uh, preceding chapter. The verse is sorry. That's how you become a vessel of dishonor. God says, I know they're insulting you, but don't say anything. Don't defend it. Don't, don't. You say, me, if I don't talk, they will not be trampling on me. This is like I don't know how to defend myself. Then you wire the person back. Then you lose a step in your journey of being a vessel unto honor. Check the people who you look up to. As models, how many of them used to insult people on social media? I'm asking now. Be practical. All the persons that you love, I love his spirit. I love how gentle he is. I love how many of them used to insult people on social media. There was a guy that gave a down his own prophecy. Very manipulative this thing on, on Facebook. So one of the first things I did was I, I went to his page because he concerned my wife. Yeah. So I went to his page. I went and checked his page. I saw the way he spoke. This guy can't be... Because the Bible says, by your fruit, they shall know them. That was the first thing. The, 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 the primary one was that the message was not a message from God. Then I said, oh, this person, let me even go and check him. Check. So the way he was insulting people. I said, no, no, no. This guy can't be a verse from the honor. And it's not me dictating. Let's see. The next verse. Hmm. So he says, if you purge yourself, you'll be what? So how you become a vessel 
come to honor is by becoming less of yourself. You know, when you pour, you become lighter. Right? Yeah, when you purge. You... <laughs> I hope this revelation of him is inside this thing we are talking about. All right? But when you purge, what happens is that you become lighter. There are certain particles that you are carrying that leaves your body after you've done so. So vessels of honor, actually, they travel, they are lighter. They're not carrying all the baggages that everybody is carrying. That's why I've, I've, I've said this. Never regret doing the right thing. Because what leads us into the temptation of trying to become vessels of dishonor is when you think about how you did the right thing and you were treated wrongly for it. Cast your mind back. Every single time you desired, I wish I had, had insulted him was because you did the right thing and you got the wrong treatment. And you should understand that you will be, you get that. You can't be on the Lord. Uh, um, um, Jesus says that um, who will be unto you if all men speak good of you. It means you are you are you are not you are not stable. You are not. Even God, people, you know, people insult God. It doesn't mean He's wrong. <laughs> people insult God. People say a lot of, some people even say God does not exist. Just imagine that you are on earth. Somebody say you are not exist in existence. Some people say God does not exist and he's in heaven. And he say, ah, me, with all the angels, he's alive. <laughs> but you small this thing, you say, ah, I want to, no, become a vessel of honor. And how the vessel, that's why you see, when God wants to do something within the body, see, three persons can be doing the same thing, but one, we carry more weight. Because like someone once said, even when you come to the place of prayer, you come with everything that you have gained in God. God wants to pass it. <laughs> a, a, there, there is a... <laughs> Listen, just be a vessel of honor. There are certain things I don't want to say because, because of recording. All right? Let me, let me pause it. Right. You know, we feel like, you know, for me to go through the process, I have to be doing the right thing, I'll be getting the right response. It does not work that way. You'll be fooling yourself. You'll be fooling yourself. If you're going to go through process in God, it's a long time project. Oh, before you get to the point where honor begins to come, you'll be subject to a lot of dishonor. And God has to check your heart. Are you really doing this because you want to get honor? Or you are doing it for the right reason. You will subject to a lot of dishonor. First, you will go through that process. Everybody must have. You can't not have, have that kind of experience. You can't. And you can't be regretting. Say, ah, I wish if I if I'd known, I would have. No, no, no. Is that what God told you to do? Yes. So do it. And when you do it, both the bad treatment and the good tr treatment, love it and add it to your journey. That man didn't, he didn't get to this point in one day. If he tells you, I'm sure if he, if he tells you his story, he will tell you about how that, you see, you can't be. You tell, if he tells you a story of how a lot of things happen wrongly, and all of that, but now he's where he is now because he went through that process and enjoyed the process. He enjoyed it. Sometimes you say all this, I don't, you're putting on measure now. I'm not saying you should expose yourself to abuse, all right? There's a balance to that, but sometimes there are certain things we do. Sometimes there are certain experiences that God wants us to go through to go through it, experience it, know what it feels like. That's why I've, I've always said, and I'll continually say it for every place that God has led me to, I can't, I don't think back and I regret. Say, ah, I wish I did. No, did God lead me there? Yes, He did. Maybe the treatment I got wasn't right. I love, I love the experience, and I learned a whole lot from it. If I didn't learn anything, I learned what not to do when I'm in a position like that. All right? I, I learned that and I added. So I, I don't have, except God didn't lead me to the place. So that's why before I take any step, I want to be sure. This is where you, because if he leads me there, whatever I see there, I won't complain. You won't hear it in my mouth. Me. I will, I will enjoy it. 
Yeah, because when, when he's going to reward you, you reward you both for the good treatment and the bad treatment, and more for the bad treatment. Because bad treatment is you, is somebody saying that, I know you deserve the right thing, but I'm giving you less than what you deserve. So God now owes you, because he was the one who sent you there. Do you understand? He sent you there. So he has to make sure that the payment is made in full. And when he wants to pay you, he'll pay you more than what, what, what you're supposed to get. You can't carry this message without dying. Please, let's finish that reading. It says, but in the great house, they are not only vessels of gold and, and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Then it says, so that you don't assume that he's the one that decided who will become vessel of honor and vessel of dishonor. It says, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. So it's you. God has called everybody into service. But it is you allowing him work on you that that means whether you become you end up a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor. Whether you become silver, gold, wood, or earth, or clay. All right. It says if a man put in place of this, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. Then he begins to list down a few things. Say flee also, youthful loss. But follow righteousness, faith, peace. So purging is what determines how effective you you be with your service delivery. So never desire to travel heavy, travel light. Travel light. And this thing is a long-term process. It's not a one-day thing. It's a long-term process. Sometimes the journey that God sets you on, it may be after five years or ten years, you begin to reap the dividend. The problem we have sometimes is that we expect instant result. Instant. When God is trying to make you an everlasting memorial, you are thinking two years, three years. No. Think far. Think far. So this is how you become a vessel of honor, by dying, by purging, by letting go of um, things that are not consistent with the nature of the Spirit of God on your inside. Um, when am I supposed to start? 12. Okay, so I'll just take one more and uh, maybe during the next session I'll see how to complete the others. We still have um, three more different topics, two more to look at uh, before. That's for the ministers, just before the general um, session starts. All right, so let, let's take one more. Be a student of the word. Be a student of the word. Be a student of the word. Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. So <clears throat> okay. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always even to the end of the age. Now, the, thank you. Now, the, the calling to be, to go and make disciples of others um, automatically places you in a position of being a student. Hmm? Because you can't teach if you don't learn. So, when G, and you see that, you see this consistent with, if let someone read Acts chapter 1, verse 1 to 2, all right? So the, the calling for us to be disciples of nations places upon us the burden of being students. So you can't, you can't not love learning and love teaching. Acts 1.
So he tells them in Matthew 28 to go and become teachers of nations. Then the first thing he does when he when he ascends is to spend 40 days with them, teaching them day and night. That's the first thing he did. He didn't send them out immediately. Even though he had been teaching them all the while, just that the teaching, teaching he was giving them, they weren't understanding. But now their eyes had been opened. So gives them a command to go and teach. And the first thing he does is to sit them down and teach them for 40 days. So, oh, God is sending me to the nation. God is sending me to the nation. Okay, sit down and learn. Oh, no, you won't do that. Some of us love title. Do the work. <laughs> All right? Do the work. Leave title. If the title, if the body of Christ decides to confer upon you the title, that's fine. If they decide not to, that's fine. Do the work. The title is not what determines your delivery service. Do the work. There are a lot of persons within the body of Christ who are who are apostles and they, they call themselves pastors. It doesn't, it doesn't diminish what they are doing. It doesn't. That Adebo is not a pastor. Yeah. That man with that level of is not a pastor. Bishop David Oedipo is not a pastor. They're not. <laughs> but they are doing the work. So more than you celebrate titles, look out for what am I supposed to learn? See, if somebody tells you to go and build a house, what's the first thing you do? You need to know how to build a house, right? Yes. Someone says, I want you to build this house. You need, you need to just imagine they, they are telling you now. Why else now? Okay, you study civil engineering. You didn't study, you studied computer science. Someone comes and meets you and tells you. Say you want to get married. The family now says your bride, your bride price is that you build a house by yourself. You won't contact anybody. If you really love the baby, what do you do? The first thing you have to learn how to do is to what? Learn how to build. You have to learn how to build. But what we do these days is that we just are celebrating. Oh wow! I have the ministry. I've been called. I have the calling of an apostle. Hey, folks, just keep quiet and learn. Yeah. That's all God requires of you. You see, the burden of becoming the title will distract you from the work that you're supposed to do to get into the office. Because title and office are not the same thing. You can have the title and not have the office. And it is the office itself that commands. Anybody can say they are president of Nigeria from anywhere they are. All right? But if you don't live in Asso Rock, as number one person, you don't have, it means you don't have the office. You don't have it. So anybody can decide, ah, just give yourself any title. And then people will start calling. If you give yourself, if you, tomorrow now, uh, Gabriel says he's Ark Apostle. Give, people may react for the first two years. That's if you won't last that long. Because people move on very fast. They just move on to the next trend. People don't react for the first few, maybe first six months. First one year. After one year, in the next 10 years, everybody will call him an ark apostle. You don't know. You can try it. <laughs> All right. If you there, there's no name you give yourself now that after some time people will start calling you that name. If you decide now you want to change your name, after some time, people start calling you that name that you changed. After how old was Abraham when he changed his name? And eventually everybody started calling him that name, even us. The generations that were born after him still call him Abraham today. All right? So, do the work. So, what Jesus tells them here is that they are supposed to become, that he was calling them as his emissaries to go and teach. And the first thing he gives them a responsibility to do is to learn. Second Timothy 3, 14 to 17. Second Timothy 3, 14 to 17. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. Mm. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. Mm. 
All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, if you read um, First Timothy, now see, let, let some, let's read First Timothy with KJV. Uh, what version are you read from? Okay, let, let's see NLT. First Timothy 4, verse 16. Now, first year he's telling Timothy here yeah, that guy, yeah, you've been a student all your life. So he said, Yeah, Timothy is the youngest, uh, was, was the youngest bishop, pastor a church, blah blah, and all of that. Yes, but he was a student, he was taught the Bible from a child when he was a child. So he's, he's not, it wasn't by mistake that he got into that office. He had, even though he was. He was young in age. He was an elder in learning. There are people who are young in age, but they are elders in learning. You can be looking at them like uh, this small, small girl. What does he, what does she know? But the person has been learning for years. That was that was the same thing with Timothy here. Yeah. So he became the bishop of the church because they saw this this virtue in him. He had been a student of the scriptures from a tender age, and the persons who taught him were trustworthy persons. That's what Paul was saying. So you can trust the things you were taught because the persons who taught you were trustworthy persons. They committed the gospel to him. Then he was qualified to be, now become a bishop. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Mm. Mm. It says, let, let, let me read from KJV. Um, it says, take heed unto thyself. Take heed. I like that word. It, it gives that, is, that uh, caution feel, all right? It says, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, unto the teaching, and continue in them. So take heed unto the, unto the teaching, continue in them, because you can take heed today and not continue in them. So take heed, continue in them. It says, for in doing so, in taking heed and continuing in teaching, you save yourself first. Now, we said here before that the saved there is not saving or salvation. It's to keep yourself in safety. All right, because Timothy was already saved. The brethren that Paul was talking about were are also saved. All right, so Paul was talking about keeping himself in safety. So he doesn't make a shipwreck of his faith. He doesn't expose himself to unnecessary um, harm simply because he wasn't continuing in, in the doctrine. So it's for him to do so, you shall save both yourself and them that hear you. So for you to be an effective minister, oh, you must love to study. Study should never be a burden to you should never be a burden to you tomorrow we're going to be reading a book because tomorrow we are waiting for people to come so we're not <laughs> all right tomorrow we're not we're waiting for people to come so after tonight's section that's going to be a long one tonight's session is going to be a long one we're, we're ending by three so that we can rest you know and all of that then we'll start in the night the night session is going to be a very long one. Then we'll have enough time to rest. Then we'll read a book, a short book of 37 pages tomorrow before we show up. We'll read that book and have a discussion. It's camp. You, you can't have it the way you have it normally when you're in your house. All right? If, if, if you pray, I've said this before, and which is a, a principle I work with. If I pray three hours, four hours every day, if I go to camp, I must triple it. I can't go there. I can't go to camp and go and still be praying the same three hours. I, I just stay in your house. The idea to camp is I'm doing something before, but I'm coming here now to stretch myself. So the minimum, minimum when I go to camp is my target is on 12 hours. But just in case I don't hit that 12 daily, minimum 10, 9 within that range. That's because I have to stretch myself. So that's what we're doing. So love, so we still have one, two, three, then more like six or seven points to cover. Um, and we'll do that. We'll, that. we'll take teaching first in the evening, then we'll go into 